Ian, just a word of thanks to everyone who's come. Appreciate you giving up your time for half an hour or so, that, especially on such a good day. But we're here today to speak about the most important thing you'll ever face, your whereabouts and eternity, where you will be when life is over and past, for all of us of eternity to face. And the wonderful message of the gospel gives us confidence to know that every soul that trusts the Savior can be sure of a place in heaven. Because the sinless Savior died, salvation is offered to everyone and offered to you today if you're not already seeing. We pray as we read verses about salvation. You'll let me stop for a wee minute, just this Sunday afternoon at the harbor in Port of Hogue, and consider your latter end. I want to read a very solemn verse to start in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 20. And the speaker in that day, and this is his confession, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And I want today to ask you for a wee minute to consider with me the matter of God's salvation. I want to read a verse in Acts chapter 4. These verses have been read a lot at meetings over the years and over our last gospel meetings and at the harbor here. And the reason they're read is this, because they contain the wonderful message of the gospel and simple, plain language. The first verse was this, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, we are not saved. And I want to think about the matter of salvation. And next chapter four, we read these words. Be it known unto you all and to all the house of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must, we must be saved. And I want us to consider today from that verse, the must of salvation, the matter of salvation from Jeremiah 8, the must of salvation from Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, a verse that I read it read every time I've nearly spoken at this desk, and I make no apology for reading it again from Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas were in prison for the gospel. There's been an earthquake. A man has been wakened up to his need of Christ. And this is what he says, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. On thy house. And I want to thank there of the means of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And a solemn verse again for our last reading in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2. Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 1. Wherefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which had first begun to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with both signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts according to the Holy Ghost, according to his own well, and I want to finish very simply by speaking in the solemn matter of missing salvation. My friend, listen, I take it that most people in these cars today know of their need of Christ, know only too well that if they die without him, they'd never be in heaven. They also know that salvation has been provided through his death at Calvary. But my friend, you could miss it, not by rejecting it, but by just neglecting it, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I want to speak to you firstly of the matter of salvation. In Jeremiah's day, the nation of Israel was almost ruined by their sin. And they realized that they had forfeited their right to blessing. They had understood fully and completely that the place they were in was their own fault because of their own sin. And there was no chance now of them being saved. And one of the men that's speaking in this chapter, chapter 8 of Jeremiah, he says the harvest passed, the summer ended, 
and we are not saved. My friend, I want to take that out of its context today and ask you at the harbor, ask you straightly in light of eternity, how do you stand today at the harbor? This man centuries ago, he realized he hadn't salvation. He realized the nation hadn't salvation. But how do you as an individual stand today before the God of heaven? Are you saved in your car? No, you're saved. No, what you're depending on for eternity. Absolutely certain. And if tonight should be my latest breath, and tomorrow would be eternity, just hidden from my view, all is well because there was a day in life when I trusted the Savior. Or is it very true? I, we are not saved. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. We are not saved. What about you today? Where do you stand in relation to eternity? Where do you stand, my friend, in relation to the great matter of your soul's salvation? This is what it is all about today. We're not here to talk about what church you join, or whether you're baptized, or whether you're a communicant, or whether it was a day in your life when you gave your heart to Jesus. We're asking you, my friend, are you absolutely certain about the salvation of your precious soul? This man knew where he stood. He said, we are not saved. And in the matter of salvation, it is absolutely imperative that people get down to this fact. There's something missing. I haven't bought for eternity. I am not saved. That's the starting point of blessing. How do you stand today? And it's my solemn consideration to ask you, just now in the harbor, if tonight would indeed issue you out of eternity, where would you stand? How would you be? If this is your last day, if somebody said, Tommy, that has been preached for years now. My friend, tomorrow can be eternity just hidden from our view. It is indeed appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. That is why we need God's salvation. Because we're sinners in the sight of God. And God has provided a salvation for us. And you can avail yourself of it. And you know that. But how do you stand today? The great, pressing, important, all-important matter of the salvation of your soul. To lose one's health as much. To lose one's health wealth as more. To lose one's soul as such a loss as no man can restore. Your precious, never-dying soul to be lost for eternity. And whose fault will it be but your own? Whenever Christ gave his life at Calvary and God gave us some to that shameful death of suffering that you may be saved. The harvest is past. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. We are as water spilled upon the ground that cannot be gathered up again. We're ruined and lost in sin and need salvation and can have salvation. But how do you stand today when it comes to the matter of God's salvation. Again, I emphasize, we're not talking about religion. We're not talking about whether you're a member of the gospel hall or not. That wouldn't fit anyone for heaven. We're here to talk about God's salvation and what will fit a man and woman, boy and girl for eternal glory. That is what Christ died for. The matter of salvation. The next verse we read tells, teaches something about the must of salvation. We must be saved. That's what Peter preached. We must be saved. You'd almost think he heard the Lord Jesus, his Lord, say to Nicodemus a few years before Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not reformation. It's not church attendance. It's not tidying up your life. All those things may help you in relation to time, but they are not God's salvation. Peter preached here, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must, we must. You cannot afford to die without God's salvation. You cannot afford to die without God's salvation. You know why? Or has your mind been blinded as to why? Has the God of this world blinded your mind so much that you do not really understand the gross loss of your precious soul to open your eyes in hell for eternity with no hope of coming back. 
That's what's at stake here. That is why we must be saved. That is why we need to be born again. That is why we must be saved. Because we have eternity to face. And because as we stand on ourselves, we're not fit for glory. I'm no more fit for it than you are. I needed God's salvation. And I'm glad there was a day in life when I got God's salvation. Not religion or joining anything, but trusting Christ for salvation. Why do we need to be saved? Do we need to be saved? Sure. Here's why we need to be saved. Because we're all sinners lost. Every one of us. What happened in Eden's garden so long ago? The skeptic and the religious commentator and they laugh and scorn and smile every one of us the man on the platforms a testimony that man has fallen our wretched thoughts our corrupt beings our sinful natures and all points away back to the day in eden whenever we turned our back on god and threw our crowd at satan's feet and embraced the lie that he told and as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin so death is passed upon all men for that all of sin we are all sinners in the sight of God. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Every one of us are in need of God's salvation and must be saved if we're going to be in heaven. Oh, somebody says, well, I'm, I'll just be happy enough to make my own way. My friend, I'm pleading with you to listen to what God's word says. I sure eternity and sure soul salvation. And in this verse, we read, and Peter preaches it with emphasis, whereby we must, we must be saved. You know how often we make the little illusion, you didn't feel well today. You didn't feel well today when you go home from the, the drive-in meeting. Very ill. Took up to the hospital. Who one happens to no one? And a doctor said to you, listen, there's a flight leaving Aldergrove for London beyond at six o'clock tonight and we'll have you in London and we'll have an operation done by nine o'clock tonight and you'll be all right. If you don't do it, you'll be dead in the morning. There's not a man jack in the car today wouldn't be in that plane. and you would get the money and you would get there. And rightly so, anybody with tuppence worth of what would get there. But today you stand perhaps on the brink of a Christless eternity. The dreadfulness of reality of falling into hellfire without any alleviation or hope of it ever being taken from you or the hope of salvation ever being offered again. And we calmly drive away for the car at the drive-in today and laugh and turn our radios on, go home, watch the TV, sit out. My friend, listen, please, not because I'm preaching, but because the word of God says it, we must be saved. How can I get saved? Somebody may, somebody may have said, listen, Tommy, and the last of you fellas have been preaching here for two years, and we're just after gospel meetings, and many people in the car have heard the gospel before I was even born. And the knowledge of God's salvation and the need of it has been pressed upon you time and time again. Would there be someone in the car today would say, what must I do to be saved? How can I be saved? How can I get God's salvation? How can I be sure I'll never be in hell? How can I be sure whenever the Lord returns, I'll be caught away to meet him in the air? How can I be sure when I close my eyes in death, I open them in glory? That's what the man in X16 asked. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He didn't say, sirs, what must I do to clean up my life or change my religion or what's your view on that? He got down to the brass text, my friend. Oh, that people would peel away the nonsense and the rubbish and all the stuff that was around this village about God's salvation and about Christians and about this, that, and the other and get down to the bare facts. This is a matter of your soul's salvation. Here's a man, he had the sword through. He had the knife pointed at his chest. He was almost out into eternity, but he grasped with hope and with assurance the message that presented to you, what must I do to be saved? Oh, there be somebody today but ask that question and reality before God broken and their sins, longing to be saved, wanting to know that all is well. What must I do to be saved? The answer would just be the same. Believe, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
You know, these men point to this man as we would do to you, to the person and work of Christ. The means of salvation is by faith in Christ, trusting him as your savior, depending on what he has done for you at Calvary, under the conviction of sin, feeling the weight and wretchedness of our being before God, but realizing by faith, taking God on his word, that when the savior died at Calvary, when his precious blood was shed, when he cried and his finished and his work was done, there was enough done to save my precious soul. And God would save me and would want to save me because of what the Savior did at Calvary. You know, these two verses come together, X4 and 12 and X16 and 30, to point to us the means of salvation. What did Peter say when he was preaching? Neither is there salvation in any other that's the way to salvation, the way to God's heaven is Christ alone. Neither is there salvation in any other. Isn't it kind of God? Isn't it wonderfully kind of God to make the way of salvation clear and plain? I haven't met a religionist yet after 35, 36 years of giving out gospel tracts and preaching in the open air. I haven't met a religionist yet who has any firm hope of heaven who can truly say, I know I'm going to glory. You know, why faith misplaced, there's no faith that's worth anything. Faith placed in Christ is solid faith. Faith that saves is faith placed in the Son of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It tells us the story of this blessed one who came from glory, when we were all ruined and lost in sin, without any hope in ourselves. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When we were all found ruined and wretched and hopeless and helpless, the Son of God stepped in. God in wondrous love sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came unto the world to save sinners. Down from the glory, the Savior came. Down to the cross from the death of shame. Gazing in wonder, the hymn writer has said. And we as believers can say it as well. I there exclaim, Jesus died for me. That's the message of the gospel. That's the truth of it. When we couldn't do anything, we were hopeless to do anything. Christ came and did it all. He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for every sinner that ever lived. That work was done and finished and completed at Calvary. And God was satisfied when he raised him from the dead. What a wonderful, glorious message of salvation. Not religion, salvation. That which rescues the sinner and is lost and ruined condition. That which snatches him from hopelessness and helplessness. And snatches him from a burning hell and gives him God's salvation and lifts him and blesses him eternally. That is what God is offering you today. The means of salvation through Christ, through this blessed one who came and went to the cross and suffered and bled and died for us there at the cross of shame. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. The ruined and wretched sin that was ours was laid on the sinless head of the holy, competent Christ of God at Calvary. On him almighty vengeance fell, and must have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a ruined race, and thus became our hiding place, wonderful, glorious truth of the gospel. He who his own self bare our sin and his own body on the tree. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The means of salvation is Christ. How you, how you make it your own is by faith. All that has been done. Nothing else needs to be done. You couldn't do anything anyway. That's the truth of it all. You couldn't do anything anyway. So I've been a wee boy. 
You almost are brought up to believe you have to do something to please God or keep in the favor with God. My friend, we're too wretched for that. We're too ruined for that. God had to step in in saving power and in saving love. How is it to be done? Giving of a son. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. I couldn't have died for your son because I'm a sinner as well. One of the most religious men in our Bible, the, the sinless Christ, took them to his face and said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. He said to an empty woman in the next chapter, five men through her, living in all types of sin. He says, you know, you have nothing either, but I can give you water that will satisfy you eternally. We have nothing to give God. We are nothing before God except ruined sinners. The people that preach at this platform, the people that meet in the gospel hall are no better than anyone else. We are all ruined sinners, but there was a day in our life when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. That was the only difference. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. We are encouraging you today, today to do the same. That's the, what's missing in this great plan of salvation that comes to you. It's your acceptance of it. You're putting your faith in Christ. You turning away in repentance. Yes, I feel I'm a sinner. The man in Acts 16, he didn't say, what must I do to be saved? Because he was wondering about his holidays the next year. He wanted to be saved because he realized I'm only a step away from death and I'm about to face the eternal fire and I need God's salvation. What must I do? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I said, this is for eternity. This is for eternity. And you cannot do it. If you were on that plane for London tomorrow and you got there to whatever hospital and the doctor looked at you and said, well, listen, we're glad to see you. Uh, you've made a big effort here, but when I give you this injection, it might work or it might not work. I said, if you come to Christ today, place your faith and trust in him according to my Bible. Thou shalt be saved. God's not in the, the business of clouding this issue. God's not in the business of making people wonder are they all right and they spend the rest of their life with their fingers crossed, hoping whenever they reach the end, all will be well. That salvation is definite. You know why it's definite? It's built upon the work of Christ. It's not built on me. It's not built on my doing or trying. I'm far, far too ruined to do anything. God has stepped in in grace and provided a salvation for everyone, no matter who they are, no matter how vile they are, no matter how far away from God they are. And the means is this, the person and work of Christ and what he accomplished for sinners at Calvary. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That makes it very pointed. Just in Christ. What about everyone else? My friend, listen, please. I, I was videoed one day uh, ever in England, a man in a video camera when I was preaching. And he was trying to intimidate me. He kept saying to me, I don't believe that. Don't believe that. I, I was of another faith. But I just kept preaching the verses that I'm preaching to you. You know why? You know why? Because I would rather listen to the words of the Son of God and depend on them than the religions of men and the nonsense out there. That's well. Here's what the Son of God said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know what they preached after he went back to heaven? To him give all the prophets witness that whosoever believeth on him shall receive the remission of sins. That's what I need, the remission of all my sins or I cannot go to heaven. It's preached to me freely and graciously through the work of Christ. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and all they who believe in him are justified. That's what we need. Instead of condemned, justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. I am the good shepherd, not a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He didn't say, I am a door. And somebody, 
He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He that believeth on the Son, there's, there it is again, simply, plainly focusing the mind of every sinner who wants in reality to be right with God, focusing it on Christ. He that believeth on the Son, path everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came for me, because I was a lost sinner. I would have no right to call you a lost sinner, but the Bible calls us all that. Every one of us. That's who he came to save. The matter of salvation, how do you stand? We are not saved. The must of salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The means of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be. My friend, you wouldn't want anything less than certainty when it comes to eternity. You cannot have anything less. I cannot go home to number 32 tonight and say goodbye to everyone and put my books away and not be sure. I am sure I'm going to heaven, not because I'm one millimeter better than you, because I'm not. Neither is anyone else here. I'm sure I'm going to heaven because Christ died for me and paid for the price of my son at Calvary. How do I know? The Bible tells me that. The Bible tells me so. There's a day in life, but like the Philippian jailer, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we want you to do. We can't make anyone do it. You won't be forced or coerced into that. That is your decision. I wonder, would there be anyone wish to be saved? I would like to be saved to someone. I really would. I would like to know that all is well for eternity and I'm saved and I'll never be in hell. The fire and the torment my eyes will never see. And you know, Tommy... Appreciate you man preaching here and appreciate the people that are out the doors with gospel literature. And you know, I'll, I'll get that someday. Yes, I, I'll get it someday. Oh, well, you know, someday just, I, I'll just, uh, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect? You know, I look into people's faces here. Some people I've known for a wee while. Good people, just as good a people as me, certainly. Or anyone else that stands at this desk. That's not the question. You hope to be in heaven. Oh, you do. If somebody was standing at the corner there in half an hour telling people to turn over a new leaf or go and get baptized and it would take you to heaven, you'll go by shaking your head and say, well, we're really old nonsense. Them people never read their Bible. But you're not saved. You know what you're going to do? I'm, I, I hope I'm wrong on this. Of course, I hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm saying it so that I won't be wrong. So I will be wrong. Just neglect it. Push it to the side. Don't face up to it. Just hope that it'll go away and some other day. It'll... How shall we escape? You're not going to escape. Many people do reject salvation. Very few people reject it, but the millions neglect it until it's too late. And because we have no guarantee of how long we're going to live, or when the Lord returns, we are bound to be near a soon return. I don't, I, only, I don't say this to play on people's emotions. I only ask you, and you can open your mind and you'll know what I'm talking about. Look at the wickedness of the world. All that's wrong is now right. Every filth and abomination is just the thing to be now. As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Given and get, get, given, buying, selling, giving, and marriage, just the ordinary things of life, nothing wrong with those. But at the end of the day, everything except God. Just neglect it. Just put it off. How shall we escape? Please don't miss God's salvation. You're not here today because you're rejecting. You may be reject, you may be neglecting it. And tomorrow could be eternity, just hidden from our view. Might be. 
It may be. If it is for you, where will you be in eternity? The harvest is past. The summer has ended. We are not saved. What about your precious soul for eternity? Whereby we must be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. My friend, we encourage you to trust him today. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith in him. That's the message of the Bible. And God wants you to be in glory. God our Saviour will have all men to be saved. And come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom for all. To be testified in due time. Salvation. What a precious word. Salvation, what a theme. It casts across the sinner's path a radiant heavenly beam. However cheerless, dark, and sad the path before he trod, salvation comes with blissful lays and lifts the soul to God. If you trust in Christ today, you have something worth having. We commend our Savior to you. That you may put your faith and trust in him. Thank you for coming. Sorry for the over time. We chose in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy wonderful salvation. We never could have bought it ourselves. We never could have merited it by our good works. We're glad that Christ paid for it and full on the cross. And we pray as we're still preaching about it in these last days before the return of thy son, that someone even today in the car park, if not already saved, will come and think about it and take what they're offering so freely in thy grace and what the Savior so dearly paid for. We stand the first day of a new week. May all of us know thy blessing amid the trials and pressures and worries of life and many, many trying to keep businesses open and health not good and all the other things that are troubling people. May they be with them all in this. But above all else, may we come to know peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask thy parting blessing in the Savior's name. Thanks very much for coming. Please come back next week to hear Richard again.